Okay, cool. Uh, as I said before, you guys just interrupt me, um, right? If you have a question or if I, something isn't making sense, um, and we will uh, we'll go from there. Um, we will. This will go beyond today, but I want to um, talk about uh, some of the basic dynamics of our ocean planet. It's important you guys understand these because just about all of these factors, even though they're, we're not going to um, you know, spend weeks and weeks on these things, they have significant implications for management. And one, and I'll just say, for example, a really interesting midterm or finals question that someone, some instructor for this class might ask is something to the effect of, hey, how, what, what man, um, name a basic property of the ocean that has that's led to a direct management challenge we're trying to deal with today, for example. So you can see how these things can play out in terms of the distribution of organisms. You can see how these things play out in terms of where we want to live, in terms of um, uh, climate, um, uh, uh, why it is warm in Great Britain, warmer in Great Britain than we'd think by, by chance, all, all these various things. So, so it's important you guys have a sense uh, and I know you're not all oceanographers. I know you're not going to be chemical oceanographers or anything, but but you need a basic understanding of this to really understand these management challenges. So we'll start off the conversation today um, with a, a discussion I call the rinsings of the earth. So the basic basic uh, physics of the ocean. So we're starting off with a, a, a painting. This is a, one of my father's paintings um, and uh, of an aurora. And uh, uh, sometimes we, we think of the earth as magical based on the stuff around the earth, right? The lights on the earth, the auroras coming off of them or whatever. But um, the, the neatest thing about the earth is the blueness of it, is, is the water. We are living on a water planet. And sometimes we, we highlight the things that aren't the water. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you guys is this thing. And I want to see if anybody has a guess as to what this thing is. So you guys unmute and just toss out some ideas what this might be. Aurora Borealis. Good guess. Yeah, it looks like kind of like a sort of light, you know, kind of a, a pixelated picture of something in the, in the night sky or something. Good guess, but no. Other guesses? Light shining through the ocean. Oh, good one. I like that one. Yeah, that's I totally see that light beams coming down. Yeah, totally. But uh, but no, but good one. You gotta be some more guesses. Uh, light pollution. Uh, could be light pollution. Um, uh, but but it's not. But but yeah, sure. I can totally see how that that would make it. That, that's a, that's a, a logical guess. It's so exciting. It's so tense. What's the answer? Do we get a hint? <laughs> Michelle's just like, tell us the answer. This is killing us. Okay, so this is um, this is a, this is a zoom in of that. So there's a blow up of that. Does that help anybody? Probably not. Is it a star? Yeah, it, it it looks like a star. Yeah, and so it's that that that's the closest guess. Oh, so, is, isn't it the Earth itself? That is the Earth. This is the farthest away picture we have of the Earth. So this is an amazing photograph. So um, I don't normally read stuff to you guys, but I'm gonna, this is the, one of the few things I'll read to you. This is just a, sh a short, um, a short uh, description. And so uh, this is from uh, Carl Sagan. He wrote a book uh, called Pale Blue Dot. Um, and essentially the jumping off point was this photograph or is this photograph. Um, and so this, what I'm gonna to read to you is from a, a, a seminar he gave in 19, in about this time of year in 1994, in, in early October of 1994. And um, this was um, in the wake of getting photographs from Voyager 1. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 
are the most distant objects that our species has created and thrown out into the universe. So these are probes that were uh, created and launched and they went around some of the, the outer planets and, and, and um, collected some data on them. But then they just kept going farther and farther. And then when they got to the edge of the solar system, they just kept going. And so they're essentially on their own. And um, we, we've, we've since gotten, gotten some signals from them, but essentially as we were leaving, uh, you know, useful contact with them, the astronomers just said, hey, spin around, look back to Earth and take a photo. And it just so happened, just purely by chance, that they caught this image. And so this image right here, or this is a blow up of this image right here. And what you're seeing, that blueness, that is the Earth, that is our home. And so, um, so Carl Sagan said, and I'll read this, he said, talking about this spinning Voyager one back and taking the photo, we succeeded in taking that picture from deep space. And if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, Every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives. The aggregate of all of our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived here on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that glory and in triumph, they could become the momentary master of a fraction of this dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants, inhabitants of one corner of the dot on scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner of the dot. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds, our posturing, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale blue light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there's no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It's up to us. It's been said that astronomy is a humbling, and I might add, character-building experience. To my, to my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So that's us, that's our planet. From far away, you can't see all the terrorists, you can't see all the glory. All you can see is this blue, this, this shining reflecting of light from our sun. As we've gone out into the, uh, to the, to the, the cosmos, into the solar system, one of the first things we're interested in looking for is water. So the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is water and the magical, miracle, awesomeness, insanely cool thing that is water. It's so important that all of our efforts to go to space, all of our ex efforts to, you know, make a colony on the moon and Mars and everything, water is central to all that. The first step is, can we find some water? So for example, we spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy looking for water outside of the earth. And so uh, Mars is a popular place that we're interested in. So here's Mars. This is an image from 2005. This is a relatively large crater, 35 kilometers. And what we're looking at, this is a false, false color image to highlight stuff. But what we're looking at is, uh, what seems to be frozen water. And this water in the middle of this crater is essentially in the shadow of the sun. And as we've looked, we, find, we found more evidence that water does exist on Mars. So here's 2008. And this is 
um, our rover has gone down and taken a, a, a shovel scoop of the soil. And so we don't say day one, day two, because um, it's a different length. So we talk about sols as, as a, a spinning of the planet, one, one, one revolution of the planet. And so, but if you look here in the lower left, if you look here in the lower left of this image, what you see is we scooped out this, the, 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 the bucket went down, scraped the soil, pulled out the soil to do some analysis. But then we took another picture a couple of days later, stuff is gone. And so it looks like these crystals have evaporated. Um, that may well have been water or water mixed with carbon dioxide and it essentially evaporated. Uh, in 2011, we had some more images uh, from one of our um, remote sensing uh, satellites in, in orbit. And uh, it sure looks like this could be um, evidence of, of melting of water and melting of water as we go through the course of this uh, time series. Although this isn't proof of water, but, but it's consistent with water. Thing, th this stuff seems to be behaving how water would, for example, flow downhill. And then most recently, this summer, the European Space Agency um, has come up with a study where they think they've located large volumes of subsurface frozen water, ice, um, at the South Pole of Mars. So um, all of this is, is mounting evidence. And as we go forward, we're finding more and more reserves potentially of water on Mars, which is great news, but it's also super telling. We're spending all of this time. We're using inference. We're using best guess because water is not abundant on Mars the way it is on Earth. When we do have water, it seems to primarily be in a gaseous form or in a frozen ice solid form. The Earth is cool because we have all that stuff to get. Oh, sorry. Let me talk about a couple other examples. So we also have some evidence of, of water elsewhere. Uh, so this is um, this is on uh, Saturn's moon uh, Enceladus, and we're we're seeing actual uh, activ geologic activity here. And so this photo is taken looking, you know, on the edge of the of the uh, moon, and you can see this stuff erupting. And what we think might be going on there is that we might have this frozen ice shell on the surface, and we might because of uh, uh, geologic activity in the core of the moon. We, it might be warm enough that we have actual liquid oceans of liquid water underneath this um, frozen world. And what we're seeing there was, was just essentially jets and cracks, if you will, in the surface of the ice um, on Enceladus. Okay, so all kinds of cool stuff, all neat things, all intriguing things, but it's all to find something that's a pale imitation of our planet. Our planet is a water world. Um, when we talk about the oceans, you might have heard of people talk about the seven seas or the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. And those are, you know, we, we use those terms, but really our planet is surrounded by a world ocean. It's one system. It's one unified body of water um, for the most part. I have some factoids. I want you to know these factoids. These are perfect for things like quizzes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you should know them so that you <clears throat> memorize them, not for the sake of memorizing them, but because they, they imply a lot. Um, now, when we talk about factoids about um, the depth of the ocean or all these kind of things, it gets hard because we're measuring the entirety of the earth. So different references will sometimes have a slightly different number in terms of the, the exact average depth of the, the ocean. So suffice it to say, we'll use these for our class. Um, but understand that if you looked it up in, in a, a textbook from the 1950s versus a textbook from the 1980s, things might change a little bit or change slightly. Um, first thing to say is that the vast majority of the surface of our planet is water, is this global ocean. 71% of the surface of the ocean is water. On average, we're a little bit short of four kilometers deep on average. So the average point in the ocean, uh, the average bottom of the ocean, excuse me, the benthos, has almost four kilometers of water pushing down on it. The deepest part of the world ocean 
is one of those trenches that we mentioned in our previous lecture is one of those trenches and the deepest of the trenches is the Marion is the challenger deep part of the Marianas trench. This extends from the surface down over 11 kilometers to to solid uh, material. Huge volume of water. In fact, the ocean is the largest um, living space on the earth by far, by far. So <clears throat> the ocean contains not, almost all of the world's water. So 96.5% of the, of the world's water. And you'll see when we get some of these other, when we take water resources, see some of these other future figures I'll show, the numbers change slightly, but the take home is, you know, the vast majority of water, well over 95% is in the form of salt water. The average temperature is of the ocean, we measure the relatively warm surface waters, the cold deep water is about three degrees Celsius. So just a little teeny bit above freezing, the average temperature of the, of the ocean. We have had this global ocean in existence for 3.4 billion years. So the vast majority of our more than 4 billion year existence as a planet is um, it, we've had an ocean, right? So uh, a lot of time for things to evolve, a lot of time for things to change, a lot of things, a lot of time for things to turn into new things in this world ocean. The most conspicuous feature, the largest single feature in the world ocean are the oceanic mountain ridges, those, those ridges we mentioned that are these mountain chains underneath the surface of the ocean. We don't see them typically because they're covered with water, but they are the, bit, the largest feature. The tallest thing on the planet, the, 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 the greatest geological relief is the Hawaiian island um, uh, that uh, is Mauna Kea, okay? So the big island of Hawaii. Mauna Kea. We think of it as a huge mountain, and it is a huge mountain for us. It goes more than four kilometers up in the air. That's a huge place. That's why we have these telescopes there, right? That's why uh, the native Hawaiians, it's a sacred place to them, and, and, and why we have ski resorts, you know, snow on there and stuff of that nature. But the reality is, it's not a four kilometer mountain. It's a more than 10 kilometer mountain, because most of it is in the water. So we have here, the majority of the surface is water. We have some, the average depth is almost four kilometers deep. More than 96% of the water on the world is in the ocean. It's just on average, slightly above freezing. It's been here for billions of years. And we have some of these really dramatic um, aspects of our planet that we are by and large ignorant of when we just look at the surface. You can't see those oceanic ridges. You can't see the full extent of Mauna Kea if you just look in the air. What does um, YBP stand for? Oh, sorry. Years before present. Apologies. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's 64,000 kilometers long and by yes. 10 high. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, those are two different things. So the oceanic ridge goes for 64,000 kilometers. That's one thing. But then the biggest single thing, the biggest like one mountain is Mauna Kea. So they're two, okay. different, two different things. So, so Mauna Kea is not part of the oceanic mountain range. Uh, okay. It, it's, a, it's a volcanic, remember we talked about there's like the, the ridges and there's the volcanic islands. It's an example of a volcanic island. Cool. Other, other things I've not clarified. Or, uh, or... What's the pressure in the Mariana Trench? Like how heavy oh. is the water above? Uh, great question. Ashi, save that for a future lecture. But the short version is for every 33 feet that we go into. Okay, so, so right now where we are here, California, uh, uh, surface, you know, at, at, at the um, near the ocean. From here, all the way to the top of our atmosphere, all of that pressure and squeezing and weight of air on, on your body, on your eyes, on your fingers, all that stuff. That's what we call one atmosphere of 
worth of pressure. Um, uh, if we go 33 feet into the ocean, so you, you hold your breath, you, you plug your nose and you just swim down 33 feet, which just about everybody could. Um, uh, that's another atmosphere's worth of pressure. Okay. So at that point, you're experiencing twice the amount of pressure that you are uh, at land on, on, uh, at, at CSUCI. For every 33 feet or 10 meters, however you wanna, however you wanna measure it, but, but basically for every 10 meters you go into the ocean, you're gonna get another atmosphere of pressure and another atmosphere and another atmosphere. So to, so to do that, so that you can calculate yourself. So you can go to, um, you can go to this, right? And so it could be, this is 11,033 meters and divide that by 33. And that's going to be how many um, atmospheres worth of pressure are on you. And I, I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't, but it's a crap load is the technical, is the short answer. I mean, it's, it's, um, James Cameron just recently went down because he's James Cameron. He has a gazillion billion dollars and he's super obsessed with, uh, with diving. Um, so ever since he's a little kid, um, that's when he made the movie The Abyss was a story he wrote in high school and everything. And, and, and he made Titanic, right? He made Titanic, but also Titanic was a sort of excuse for him to rent these Russian submersibles and go down to, to, to the, to the um, wreck of the Titanic. Right, so we had to make a dr dramatic movie to sort of justify his playing around there. But he also built his own custom, um, essentially submarine. He went down to the Marianas Trench. Before then, only two other people in history had ever been to the bottom and they super lucked out. I'll tell you guys the story of that. They, they, they super lucked out. Um, but uh, in the Bathys scaff, in, in essentially this, this metal sphere, in the mid part of the night, in, in, in the wake of World War II, um, that was just crazy. After they went down, crazy they didn't die. I mean, really, really crazy they didn't die. But so they got back and everything was, was cool. Um, we tried to go back and it took until James Cameron got back there in just the last couple of years for humans to get back there. Many, many attempts failed. Um, I mean, most recently there was a Japanese um, submersible and they were trying to go down and check it out. Japanese, awesome folks, highly technological, fantastic um, uh, competencies in terms of engineering and everything. Stuff would break all the time. Like so, so getting so working in these incredibly deep depths, incredibly high pressures is completely non-trivial. It is, it is very, 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 very difficult. So um, that's a long way of me not answering Clara to say that it's a lot of pressure, but. Um, but yeah, it's 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 insane. It's it's so totally it's insane. it's possible, and it's been done before. We've gotten to the bottom of the bottom. Humans have been there twice. Yeah, three, three three human beings have been to the bottom. Yeah. Wow, it is crazy. It's totally crazy. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a lot to be bummed out about our technology and pollution and everything. But there's a lot of awesome stuff that we've done as a species. And I would say this going to the bottom of the ocean is one of those incredible triumphs. I mean, it really. Just, just the, the prowess to be able to not be crushed um, is incredible. Is incredible. So yeah, good. All right, cool. Other, other questions. Okay, so here's an example of, of I mentioned that some of the numbers vary depending on how we're measuring it. So this one I la said last time, ninety six point five percent of the of the um, world's water is in the ocean. This other calculation suggests it's ninety seven point three, right? So I'm not gonna kill you if you use 96 or 97, but, but it, you need to know these, these, these key points, these, these key points, it's the vast majority. And so here we go. So where is the earth's water? So 96, 97% is in the ocean. Uh, a few percent is locked in frozen form in the North or South Pole area or the Greenland ice shield. And then, the stuff that you and I use all the time that is a source for our water, is a store, uh, source for our society, agriculture, industry, everything else, it's a fraction of a percent, right? A fraction of a percent in groundwater, which we're depleting rapidly in places like California, et cetera, with the drought. But then we talk about the things we normally think of, quote unquote, as our water sources are, are easily um, abundant, accessible places, lakes, rivers, streams, it's, it's, you know, fractions of a percent. 
Um, so the ocean is really where the story is in terms of water on our planet. Now, water is totally blow your mind. Oh my God, this is crazy. You guys should all be water for Halloween. Uh, that's me. You should, you should be your own character for Halloween. But water would be an awesome costume because it's so epic. So, um, okay. One of the things that makes our earth a magic place uh, has allowed life to evolve the way life has evolved. The reason why your eyeballs see radiation the way they do and on and on and on is because of the physics of water molecules and how those water molecules interact with other substances. So first and foremost, we have three states of water and unbelievably crazily on the surface of the earth, we have all three of those phases at the same time in abundance. So let's talk about, uh, let's have a quick review about those phases of, of, uh, of water. Um, so uh, I'll, I'm gonna run through these different examples, but first I wanna just take us back to chemistry class for a second and mention that um, water is gonna behave the way water is gonna behave um, due to two opposing forces. One of those forces is so-called hydrogen bonds or hydrogen bonding. And those are gonna to act to hold water molecules together. That's a pulling together force. An opposite force, which is a pushing apart force, that is thermal energy, that's heat, that's warmth. And so that, that's making us vibrate. And as we vibrate, we're, trying to, we're, we're pushing up against one another and we're pushing each other farther away. Okay, so the three phases of water. The first phase we have is ice, is the solid phase. Now this is the low temperature side of the three phases, obviously. In ice, the hydrogen bonds are winning out over the thermal energy. So, so the, the, the togetherness is much stronger than the, the energies pushing us apart. And because of the unique geometry of uh, um, um, hydrogen and oxygen and the way they're oriented, they, that this allows the, these molecules to be packed in a regular lattice. So now this is, so we're looking at this on our screens. This is two dimensional, but really you have to picture this is a three dimensional structure. Okay, so ice is a three dimensional structure. And I'm trying to highlight that here with this three dimensional figure, but it, it's, not, it's not ideal. Um, so I'm just going to show for di for illustration purposes. I'm going to sh shove that three-dimensional image down to a two-dimensional image. So that's what we're looking at here. Okay. So each of the the dots, the yellow dots, represent a water molecule, and then the lattice is is representing the relationships. Does that make sense? So this is ice that we're looking at. Okay. The next phase is liquid. Now in the liquid phase, this is an, a betwixt between thing. So this is where essentially the hydrogen bonds, the squeezing us together, are about as strong as the forces pushing us apart. So they're, they're roughly comparable. And so what we see in water is we don't have that regular lattice. We have this sort of mixed up gunk. And so here we have some of the water molecules are orienting themselves relative to other water molecules. But then we have other molecules that are just kind of off doing their own thing. So we have a mixture between some structured water oriented molecules and some free water in that mix. And then obviously the third phase is the gaseous phase. So here, this is, this is the high temperature side of things. Here, um, the thermal energy is winning the show. So the energies shoving us apart are much stronger than the energies that are trying to keep us together. And what we have in effect now are independent molecules. So the water, or the water molecules are so energetic, they boing, 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 they bounced off each other and they're far from one another. So they're independent. Does that make sense? Everybody with me so far? Okay, now why did I go through that? I went through that because those that basic physics, that basic chemistry leads to a bunch of highly unique things, massively unique things, magically unique things, like crazier than Harry Potter making some spells kind of crazy things, right? Crazy than Darth Vader being Luke Skywalker's father kind of things. So, and I'm, I'm listing those here. 
again, all emerging directly because of, of the, the physics of these, of these water molecules. Okay, so the first is thermal inertia. Water has incredible thermal inertia. So we can talk about that in a couple different flavors, but they all are, are under the banner of thermal inertia. The first is high heat capacity. That means the amount of heat that we have to add to a unit of water to get it to change temperature. And so the standard measurement is one gram of liquid water at, 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 at standard temperature and pressure, one gram of liquid water to raise it one degree Celsius. The only thing we know of, I'll say it again, the only thing we know of that has a higher heat capacity is liquid ammonia. So this is this is so this leads to all kinds of important things about the behavior of energy on Earth, and therefore, um, uh, hold on, the, the garbage guys are outside. Let me just close the door. I'll close my window real quick. Sorry. Uh, so so high heat capacity. So so this allows thermal buffering, right? This allows us to move heat from the tropics to the British Isles, for example. Um, so high heat capacity. Next, latent heat of fusion. And this is how much energy we have to add to one gram of ice uh, to turn into liquid, right? And so again, uh, uh, water has a seriously high heat capacity. It also has a very high latent heat of fusion. The only thing that is greater, again, is that ammonia stuff we mentioned before. And then we can talk about the latent heat of evaporation. And this is, this is where we tried to um, uh, uh, change the um, temperature of uh, gaseous, um, to, to go from liquid to gaseous, to go from water to gas. And indeed, it has the highest latent heat of evaporation of anything. So water, water, so in terms of thermal inertia, we're either the, the most craziest we've ever found or we're second most craziest. So that's awesome. So thermal inertia. The next cool thing about water is the ability, uh, how it behaves when it expands. So think about this. Um, what am I, okay, I, here's, here's, I'm having a, uh, what am I drinking? I'm drinking a sparkling ice caffeine. Mmm, delicious. I should, get, I should get some kind of sponsor credit or something. Okay, aluminum here, right? So here's aluminum. Let's take this can, let's melt it in a furnace, okay? Uh, and and uh, so we have liquid, we have liquid water, okay? And then we, and then, or excuse me, not liquid water, we have liquid aluminum. You can imagine a liquid bucket of aluminum. And then I take my can here and I throw it in that can and I throw it in that um, liquid it's gonna sink to the bottom. It's a solid, right? The liquid version is less dense. The solid stuff's gonna sink. If I had a steel girder and did the same thing, if I had liquid steel and I threw my steel girder in there to you know, melt it, it's gonna first sink to the bottom of the, of the bucket of liquid metal, right? Water is not like that at all. The density of water is going to change with temperature, as with most things, but unusually, it's going to be its most dense before it freezes. It's going to be its most dense before it becomes a solid. So water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. And remember, we said that that that's a that's roughly the average temperature of the of the global ocean. Um, and so what that what that's going to mean is ice is going to float on the surface of the water. So when we so 4 degrees C is dense and then when we hit 0 degrees C it's less dense in the water. So it floats. That's crazy. That's super super bizarre. Um when we take all these things and put them together, we get some trippy behavior. So one of these things, this high inertia uh, thermal inertia is this so this is the day-night temperature difference of the Earth. So this is a photo from satellite, or this is a bunch of photos from satellite, or a bunch of sensor data from satellites, I should say. 
And we took a picture at midnight and we took a picture at noon and we measured the, the temperature at the surface of the, uh, at the surface. And now uh, we're looking at the difference. So, so what's the pattern that you guys see here? What, what's the pattern you guys see in terms of the colors? The water is cool and the land is warm. Uh, kind of, kind of, yeah. But actually, not, not, not exactly, but that's close, Tyler. So obviously the land is warm, right? So this is, remember, this is difference. So this isn't, this isn't, so this is, this is change between time one and time two. So Tyler's talking about this. This is this is a, a, a you know a, a color ramp, right? And so this is higher, but oops, but but we're not looking at the temperature at one point in time. We're looking at, at temperature one minus temperature two. Uh, the differences are more at the equator. Yeah, right. So so one one it's it's strongest right here where the sun is the strongest. So both, so that, that's good. Somebody else go with what uh, Tyler and Brian just said. Uh, the ocean uh, temperature difference is more stable. Yes, exactly. Yes, Alejandro has it. So, so this is what, oh, geez, this is white, right? If you look at our, our scale here, yes, it says white's a little bit slightly negative, but the point is white and this light golden yellow color here means not, not massively different, right? So most of the area here is a little bit blue or a little bit white, right? Almost the same temperature when the sun is shining as when the sun is down. Whereas on land, let's say, let's take uh, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa here, man, it's like a 30 degree ch change between night and day. Right, same thing in in you know New Mexico or whatever. It's like a I don't know what that is twenty degrees or something difference on average, day versus night. So this thermal inertia is buffering those differences. Right, it's maybe not super hot in any one spot, but it's not going to have a wide temperature swings. Whereas here on land, huge temperature swings potentially, hot hot, cold cold. That's a consequence of water. That's a magic property of our planet. Okay, another really cool aspect of water, have we done on time? Another cool aspect of water is the unique, um, uh, unique way um, water handles other substances. And so in particular, water is known as the universal solvent. So we can throw stuff into water and almost all the time that stuff will um, go into solution. Salt is the classic example right here, right? So sodium chloride, NaCl, we throw it in and the um, uh, oxygen, uh, right? Forms an ionic attraction to the sodium. And then the, hi the hydrogen forms an association with the chlorine or the chloride and um, and, and so it does, it's dissolved. And, no, and so when you take that white salt and drip it into your, your, your glass of water, it becomes clear, right? It all gets salt, um, um, becomes dissolved. So uh, incredible uh, dissolving power, uh, power um, allows for all kinds of other cool phenomenon. Um, and, uh, and this can also uh, keep water from freezing if we have a lot of stuff dissolved in it. So we, it can allow us to have free flowing water in times in, in places where maybe we wouldn't. So um, some, for example, fish, ice fish use this. They essentially have antifreeze in their blood. And even though they might be in temperatures that are, that, are, that you know, in and around frozen icebergs and stuff, they don't freeze. Their blood doesn't freeze. So um, playing off the dissolving power of water. Next, transparency. So water allows some electromagnetic radiation to go through really easily, others not. So 
infrared is rapidly absorbed. So energy in the infrared spectrum. Visual energy is um, at least uh, for a few, few meters is transmitted pretty readily. That's why water looks clear to us and not opaque or something else. Ultraviolet absorbed. So the basically the, the bandwidth that you and I see in, shocker, shocker, um, uh, sunlight goes through that really well, right? And so, so our eyes have evolved to sense this radiation because it's radiation that goes through our atmosphere, the water vapor under the atmosphere penetrates. We don't see, our eyeballs don't see particularly well in infrared. We don't see particularly well in ultraviolet. Okay, um, so next I wanna just touch on, make sure we're all on the same page with, with what wa seawater is. Okay, so that was all about water in general. Now we're talking about uh, salty water, seawater. Seawater is first and foremost, it's mostly made up of water. Remember the universal solvent. And then we've dissolved a bunch of stuff in there. So two broad categories of stuff in the water. First, suspended material. This would be stuff like microplastics. This would be stuff that's small, but it's, you know, if we looked really close to the magnifying glass, we would see a, fle a fleck of something, right? A little chunk of something floating in there. So that's a suspend, that's material in suspension. Um, dissolved material, and, and so all these things are important, but dissolved materials are really the things that give um, seawater its, its uh, uh, behavior. Okay, so we have major constituents, minor and trace constituents, nutrients, gases, and then miscellaneous organic material. Okay, so the major constituents, we say major constituents because these are globally conserved, meaning wherever we go in the ocean, it's gonna be, there might be a little bit of change, but by and large, this is, we're gonna see the same um, proportions of things there. Now, before I go on and talk about this, have a look at this. Down here on my figure, you see a percentage sign. Up here, you see something funky, right? This is not percentage. So percentage is parts of 100, per centa, you know, par parts, of, parts per 100. Uh, does anybody know the origin of why we have the percentage sign or, or who came up with the percentage sign or why we use it? No. Uh, does anybody, uh, anybody ever read uh, A Christmas Carol at Christmas time, right? Scrooge and Marley and all that stuff, right? Bob Cratchit, his clerk. So his clerk, uh, Scrooge's clerk, but when we say clerk, it means somebody that's a scribe, writing stuff down. So doing business transactions, keeping books. And so these folks in the, in the birth of the modern industrial time, right? The, uh, you know, the, the industrial revolution and all that stuff, right? All kinds of books are being kept. It's a pain in the butt to constantly be, keep writing the same thing over and over again. So this, this symbol that we have for the percentage was a shorthand. So instead of someone having to write da, da 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 slash over 100, you know, 50 out of 100 or 17 out of 100 or whatever, it was just a shorthand. So instead of writing something, something, something over 100, we did zero slash zero. We essentially dropped the, the uh, a 10. We dropped the one zero. And so we only have one of the zeros. Does that make sense? So that's the percentile sign or the percentile symbol. This is the same idea, right? We've dropped the 10. So now, instead of having zero slash zero, we have zero slash zero zero. So instead of parts per hundred, this indicates parts per thousand. You can either use this symbol if you want, zero slash zero zero, <coughs> or you can just use PPT, parts per thousand. Either of those is a common abbreviation for uh, this stuff. Okay, so uh, so for major constituents, we're not talking about 19, oops, we're not talking about 19%, right? We're talking about 19 parts per thousand. So it's not, uh, it's not 19%, it's 1.9% of, of uh, the, the seawater is chlorine. Um, 10.7 parts per thousand is sodium. 
uh, uh, 2.5 parts per thousand uh, uh, si uh, si uh, God, uh, silicon, silicate, uh, magnesium 1.3, calcium uh, 0 0.4 parts per thousand, potassium 0 0.4, and um, uh, carbolic acid and, and um, uh, carbonates, bicarbonates and stuff uh, are uh, a, a tenth of a parts per thousand. So we have these minor major constituents, excuse me, these major constituents, primarily uh, sodium and chloride, which gives us the salty taste of salt water. Then we have minor and trace constituents. Don't care about those, just various things. Um, and then nutrients. So these are, these are items in seawater that are particularly important for um, uh, uh, growth of things, of biological organisms. Okay, so we have uh, the typical stuff we think about, the nitrates, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, silicon uh, stuff. Um, we have gases. So gases here are um, uh, dissolved. So these are, these are little bubbles of gas. This is, not, this is not the molecule distributed, but these are little bubbles of uh, gaseous um, material surrounded by bubbles of water. So we have nitrogen, oxygen, and CO2. So when fish are breathing oxygen, they're not sucking out oxygen molecules, separating it from the water. They're actually finding these little dissolved bubbles of oxygen and, and they're, they're uh, taking in those little bubbles of oxygen. Um, in our atmosphere, nitrogen is the most uh, uh, abundant um, single substance. So even though you and I breathe oxygen, most of our atmosphere is nitrogenous. So uh, we have 21% um, of our atmosphere is oxygen. When we talk about surface water, this is stuff that's very close to the air interface. And this, this will be variable. This isn't, this isn't exactly the same everywhere. It, it's going to depend on the mixing and stuff. But, but just as, as a comparison, um, surface water, nitrogen is only about half of the uh, gases um, in dissolved in water. Oxygen is much higher. It's about a third of all of the um, all of the gases. And carbon dioxide is also much higher than in the atmosphere, right? It's about half of the oxygen. Uh, and, then, um, and then we have various organics, and those organics are important for other things. So again, we have seawater is water, some suspended flecks of stuff floating around in it, some dissolved materials, which are primarily these salts <clears throat> that don't change very much um, by and large across the, the uh, world's ocean. We have these key nutrients, which are important for fertilizing, essentially, growth of life. Gases, which are really important for metabolism for a lot of organisms. And then we have some organics. So that's the composition of seawater. Um, together, when we look at all of those different salts, we use the term salinity to describe that. So salinity is the concentration of inorganic salts in water. As I mentioned before, it's usually measured as parts per thousand or PPT. Um, the global mean, and this is a key factoid, this is a great question for quizzes and things of that nature. Um, way back when, when I first moved to LA for grad school, one of the first jobs I applied for was to be a, an aquarist. And the first job they asked me at this one aquarium that I was, that I was trying to get a job at, they said, what's the average salinity of, the, of seawater? Um, and so if they asked you that, you would say about 34, 35 parts per thousand. And as a reminder, this 35 parts per thousand is 3.5%. So we'd say about 35 parts per thousand. Typically, the kind of waters that you and I interact in here, that, that varies on the order of the high 30s to low 30s. So call it 33 to 37%. But if you need, if you need a global average, I would say 34 or 35 parts per thousand. But this will vary geographically. And importantly, where it varies, there's huge implications for the distribution of organisms. And it's going to vary due to evaporation. So some of that water molecule will leave and those salts will remain behind. And so it'll get saltier. 
precipitation. We're squirting in fresh water into that. So we're diluting, we're, we're making the concentrations of the salt even lower. Um, and or where a river is dumping out into the ocean. Those are all places that, that we see significant deviations from this 34, 35 parts per thousand uh, at the surface of the ocean. And so examples of this, I've just listed a few examples. So uh, the Red Sea is about 40 to 42% parts per thousand on average. <clears throat> this one Gulf in Finland where we have a lot of perennially melting glaciers. So a lot of freshwater flow all the time is mostly around five parts per thousand. So it's almost fresh. We would use the term brackish, but it's, but it's very close to freshwater. And then uh, the Dead Sea, which is the saltiest place uh, on the surface, the salt, saltiest water body on the surface of the earth naturally occurring um, is 240 parts per thousand. So you could, so if you wanna write a murder mystery uh, and you wanna have somebody drown, don't have them drown the Dead Sea because it's almost impossible to drown. You, you, you pretty much cannot go, but you have to be weighted down like crazy to go below because uh, it's so salty, you are effectively um, more buoyant um, in, uh, in that place because the salty water is more dense, your body is comparatively speaking less dense than the Dead Sea. Uh, we measure salinity um, by a couple different ways. Electrical conductance is the most common thing that we do now. R run a weak electrical current and measure, and, and the more salt, the more uh, quickly that, that electricity is gonna circulate between those, those anode and cathodes. And the more, if it's pure fresh water, it won't, um, uh, the, the, the charge won't happen. And so uh, we can use electrical conduct, conductance. We can use refraction of light, which will use a refractometer, which is a little thing that um, will, uh, when there's more stuff dissolved in the water, the light will be more refracted. And so, uh, so by the looking at how much the light is bent, that tells us how much salinity is in there. Or we can use what's called specific gravity, where we essentially look at um, how buoyant a standardized object is in a mass of water. Um, uh, nowadays, just about everybody uses electrical conductance. Um, those of us that are doing field stuff that don't want to have batteries in, in something will use a refractometer, but, um, but that's about it. If somebody's, if somebody's into aquaria and taking care of their fish, tropical fish, that kind of stuff, they will pretty much the only people that use specific gravity these days to measure salinity. Um, cool. Questions? That makes sense so far? Anybody's question about chemistry or salinity or anything so far? Okay. Um, so uh, getting close to wrapping this stuff up, but I'll just say uh, all this stuff comes together. Um, one of the ways this stuff comes together in terms of salinity, et cetera, is the density of seawater. So uh, very important for the movement of energy, et cetera, around the planet. What I'm showing you here is the relationship. So this is salinity at the top. Okay, so this is how much salt we have. So going from relatively fresh to relatively salty. And then temperature, going from relatively cold to relatively warm. And what we're looking at here is you see that we have these, um, these lines. So these lines indicate an equal density. So I can start off right here. I could be at say 10 degrees Celsius. Um, oops, excuse me, 10 degrees Celsius at about 30, a little more than 31 uh, parts per thousand. And if I do nothing else, if all I do is raise the temperature, if all I do is start here and raise the temperature, you guys can see my cursor, yeah, on the screen? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so, so if we start here and all I do is raise the temperature, I, I, don't, I don't change the stuff I'm, the constituent of the liquid. If I start right here and I go up and I just change the temperature, ooh. So we start off at 1.024, ooh. Now I'm 1.023, ooh. Now I'm 1.022, right? So I'm getting less dense. So as I just change the temperature, those seawaters become lighter. Um, what about if I keep the same temperature, let's say 10 degrees Celsius, but I start, I start uh, pull my salt shaker and start shaking some salt into that water, okay? Same temperature. So now I start off right here. Let's say again, I'm at, I'm at 1.024 and then it gets saltier. Oh, if I add a, another part per thousand, now I'm 1.025, et cetera. So as I add salt, I increase the density. Now, how does this stuff play out in the real world? Well, it plays out because 
um, denser stuff is going to tend to sink on average. Lighter stuff is going to tend to float. And by and large, this is a sort of cartoon of the planet. This is a bit, this is simplified, but it gives you, gives you get to the point. So here's the equator, zero degrees latitude. Here I'm going towards the, the pole would be 90 degrees north or, or nine degrees south. But, um, but uh, uh, in a cartoon fashion, what we have is cold seawater here, right? The poles are cold, right? The sunlight is hitting the, the, the middle part, the tropics of the, of the planet, <clears throat> warming up that water. So essentially what we have is we have cold water sinking, warm water rising. And when we combine that with uh, various other realities like continents and stuff, we tend to see some significant patterns. So first and foremost, salinity is going to vary slightly with at latitude. Remember I said the, the, the typical surface salinity and the you know, away from rivers and things, away from the rain, where it's not raining, is somewhere 34, 35 parts per thousand, right? But as we go from the tropics, it changes a little bit, right? This is on average, changes a little bit. So we're starting to see the influence of this colder, colder areas and more, more rainy type areas. And turns out we have some bands, rain tends to happen in some areas on average more than in other areas. Same thing, here's our north to south, uh, 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 sorry, here's the, here's the equator. We're going towards the pole north or the pole south. We have some areas that tend to get more rain on average. And we have some areas that tend to get less rain on average. And then other areas that tend to get more rain. And so that, that tends to influence the um, salinity of the surface of the ocean. In, in more constrained places like the Black Sea, which is very, very contained, this can get really extreme. So only evaporation and rain can lead to huge currents in these small water bodies. Just evaporation and rain alone doesn't lead to, to strong currents in the open ocean. Other things are also going on, but in these smaller water bodies um, and little embayments and stuff, we can get significant movement of water solely from the, the change salinity from raining, et cetera. Okay, we're starting to, starting to add complexity here. So we have some areas that get more rain, some areas get less rain. We have, we have all this stuff happening. We, we now are starting to get what we know as global circulation. In this case, I'm showing you just the surface water. So the water say in the top meter or a couple meters of the ocean. And we have some chunks of the ocean that where the water on average is moving uh, clockwise and other areas moving counterclockwise. That would be the Southern hemisphere. And then we have these sort of pockets, right? So here the water is kind of going boing this way, but then we have this, this Alaskan countercurrent, which is sort of a spinoff of that. And so we're starting to get this, this long-term structure and, and relatively um, a consistent structure in how water is moving around. Um, yeah, I'll just say that uh, we're getting close on time here. So I'll just say that this, this plays out in different ways, but um, suffice it to say that uh, the salinity, so salinity is, is manifest in terms of large scale patterns of, of things in the global ocean. It also has direct influence on the movement of some individual organisms. And so in this case, this would be something like a, a generic freshwater fish and a generic marine fish. And so, uh, if we take a marine fish and throw it in fresh water, it's going to die. If we take a freshwater fish and throw it in the ocean, it's going to die. Um, and, and that will happen because it's going to essentially uh, suffocate. It suffocates because of the difference in salinity of the water. Their internal salinity, their, their internal um, amount of uh, material dissolved in their blood versus the amount of stuff dissolved in the surrounding water. And because remember fish are breathing through gills. And so they're trying to get that, suck that, those gas bubbles out of the water mass. Their, their gills are an intimate connection with their blood and the water. And so if we have a radical difference in terms of salinity, we can get osmotic pressure building up and, and they can lice or rip open or, or, or split open their gills, and then essentially they, they drown. Okay.
So last thing we'll talk about here today before we wrap up is why is the ocean salty or, or alkaline? But you know, wh why, what's going on here? Um, so people figured out for, you know, didn't take them too long to figure out that, ah, uh, what's going on is the, it's raining on the beach and some sand is going into the ocean, right? It's, um, it's uh, 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 raining up on the hillside and that soil is going down into the creek and that creek is going into the river and that river is dumping into the ocean, right? And so Lavoisier, the, the, moder the French father of modern chemistry, described this as the rinsings of the earth. So the weathered inputs, the stuff coming off of the land is why the ocean is salty. Um, and I mean, a little more complex, it's not just salt, it's other things too. Basically, basically the <clears throat> water, the universal solvent acting on all these things and, and that's how we get these uh, uh, silicates and things of that nature. So we have this wet weathering stuff, but then we also have volcanic inputs potentially. So we have some things where the volcanoes are actually just directly squirting in some chemicals from the middle of the earth or, or, or some internal part of the, of the planet, yeah? So we have weathering inputs, and we have volcanic inputs. And so we get stuff like this, right? We get, we get material coming off the land, we get material going in the atmosphere and then, and then depositing. And then we have some underwater volcanoes that are directly squirting the, the, the uh, uh, material from inside the earth directly into the water. Okay, so here's my question. My last question for you guys today before we wrap is, why isn't the ocean getting saltier? If this is right, what these guys are saying that it's rinsing of the earth and it's volcanoes, right? That makes sense, but how come it's not 34 parts per thousand this year and 35 parts per thousand next year and 36 parts per thousand the year after that? Why, why is it, um, yeah, why, why is that? Ideas, guesses, unmute, unmute and give me some explanations. Is it like a closed system? Ooh, good question. Is it a closed system? Um, something related to that. Um, I don't know if I'd say it's a closed system exactly, but but you're getting at you're you're getting close. Somebody else. Somebody hasn't made a guess yet. Unmute and make a wild guess. I it's okay. Say the water cycle. Um, it's constantly in transition of of evaporation and condensation and the flow of that. Okay, good. So Jennifer was talking about the hydrological cycle. So that's cool. But remember the hydrological cycle is the water part of it for the most part, right? So the, so the H2O part. So you're right. So you're totally right in that there's a water molecule that's in the river. It's going down, boop, it's in the ocean now. And then some fish drinks it and then he pees it out and then it's floating around and then the sun hits it and then it turns into water vapor and right so so that's happening uh, totally you're right that is happening but why but so every time we do that right every time that water molecule is going to go up and hit the hillside and, and drag some dirt into the creek and then and then that that sediment is going to go into the into the ocean how come it's not getting saltier So, so does that have to do with temperature? temperature? Sorry, is water, say again? Does that have to do with temperature since everything's pretty um, constant? Ooh, good guess, good guess, but um, uh, not exactly. Something's gotta be filtering it. Something's filtering it. Are some of these salts um, either solidifying or being used by organisms? Yes, that's it. You guys got it. Clap, clap for yourselves, clap for yourselves. That was good. Monday morning, Yay. suffering through an earthquake, something through a pandemic, you guys figure that out, that's great. That's great, I love it, I love it. So yeah, exactly right. So like Jennifer is saying, yeah, we have the hydrological cycle, that water is going around and around and around, awesome. But this is the, this is, so this is the so-called steady state hypothesis. So, which is that salts are basically removed um, at essentially the same rate that they're going in, right? So that we, so that the ocean is in this, in this, um, you know, constant level or roughly constant level of, of salinity. And and the mechanism to con the mechanism that's dict that, that's regulating that, that that that's maintaining that steadiness, is biology. 
is life. And so this is what we'll end on here today. And so what we're looking at is a map of the, the crap on the bottom of the ocean, right? The ooze at the bottom of the ocean. So this is a map of the sediments of the benthos. And so let's have a look at it. So here we have some uh, tan stuff, right, up here. We have some uh, orange stuff over here. We have some, um, what's that? I don't know what the color is, periwinkle, periwinkle here. And then we have some of these triangle periwinkles. So we have some triangles here. And then we have this light green and dark green. And so uh, if you guys stare at this for a second, I think you'll see there's, there's some kind of, would, well, maybe you guys tell me, does it look like there's a pattern at all to any of these colors or no? Neuritic is at the poles. Mm -hmm. Good, what else? What, what are some other patterns you guys see? The saltier stuff is more in the middle where it's hotter, essentially. Okay, so, 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 right. Okay, so, okay, so there's, there's, for example, like this green dude, this yeah. green stuff is right along the equator. Yeah. And then, and like over here too, mostly equator, equator, and it's a little bit sort of dipping down into like Chile and stuff. And, but, 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 you know, for the most part there, uh, looks like these, these uh, triangles are mostly here in the middle part of the Atlantic. Um, this light green is really seems to be tightly associated with the, the edge of the Antarctic uh, area, right? So, so there appears to be some structure in this stuff. So what we're looking at is the, essentially one of the biological, or, or excuse me, the, the evidence of biological regulation of salinity of, the, of, of stuff in seawater, the regulation of the consistency of stuff in seawater. So what we're looking at, okay, so this, this is just basically uh, crap, you know, kind of stuff. This is, th these are fine clays. So this, this um, um, uh, tan color is fine stuff that has come off. But the ones that are the most interesting I wanna call your guys' attention to are the periwinkle and the green. Okay, so these, so this is, this is dead, um, or excuse me, this is uh, 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 abiotic stuff, abiotic stuff. This periwinkle, the, 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 the periwinkle and the green, that's dead living things. Foraminifera are um, a type of plankton that uh, float around the water column. Also, some of these people call them forams. And they have uh, really cool skeletons. Their skeletons are calcium carbonate. And they float around by essentially having oil inside themselves. So they're basically, and there's other tricks too, but, but the, they float around by having oil in themselves and they sort of um, essentially are neutrally buoyant by and large when they're alive. When they die, calcium carbonate, also we call this chalk, right? This is chalk. So when they die, now their oils kind of disappear and they go away because they're dead. And now they just have chalk. So the chalk starts to slowly fall down. Pteropods, and this is, this is pronounced pteropods, the P is silent, because I'm trying to screw with you. Uh, and so pteropods, um, are snails, are marine snails, just like we have snails in our garden, but these fly through the water. So their foot that when we think of snails are used to being, are used to being a, a foot, you know, crawling on the plant or crawling on our sidewalk or something. These guys, that foot has evolved into a wing. And so they fly through the water. Super cool, but they still have a shell and they have a, 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 a calcium carbonate based shell. So just like those other guys, they're, they're, they're swimming around and they got oils in themselves and they're kind of neutrally buoyant. But then when they die, that rigid shell, that hard shell sinks. And so what we see here is we see patterns. We see on average, a lot of foraminifera are in the soils or pteropods are in the, the, the 
stuff at the bottom of the ocean floor. Over here, we have silicaceous. So this is calcareous ooze. This is silicaceous ooze. So over here, these are things that use silicon that their shells, their, their body structures are made out of glass. Okay, so they synthesize these, right? This is one of those nutrients we talked about. So diatoms have glass shells. They look like Petri dishes that sort of fit together. Uh, radiolarians have these glass spikes, beautiful glass spikes that are sticking out of the, um, out of the individuals. And uh, both of them, same thing, when they die, that's glass now. So that glass is now heavier than water and will sink out. And so we can see uh, we have glass critters right here at the edge of the Antarctic Ocean. We have glass crit critters right here in the as band around the tropics. And then these other areas filled in by and large, we have these calcareous critters. And so what they're doing is they're sucking out the silicon, they're sucking out the calcium, and they're turning it into salt out of the water and they're turning into solid material. And that solid material is sinking out of the water column. So we're stabilizing the salinity of the ocean by regulating it. And where is it going? It's turning into material that's being incorporated into the sediment. So we have salt entering from the volcanoes and, and the rinsings of the earth. And then we have biology acting upon that material, pulling it out of solution and, and, and taking it out of the water and, and sequestering it out of the water column. That's why we have the steady state. That's why we have um, the, the global ocean is relatively consistent in terms of its salinity for millennia on going through time. Cool? Awesome. So I'll also just end with saying, that's also one of the tricks that we use to um, look at ancient oceans, to look at ancient chemistry, to look at the acidity, uh, how much carbon was in, uh, you know, how, how acidic um, our oceans were, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, um, is using this, uh, is essentially using this mechanism of, uh, of life regulating salinity and then casting off these shells. We can go find these shells and we can, using various cool chemistry techniques, we can go back and interrogate those shells and see what the chemical environment was like when they were formed. And so we can use these old, these, these oozes, these deposits around the ocean as something of a uh, historical clock to look back in time at what ancient ocean was like. Was it warmer? Was it more acidic? Um, was there more carbon dioxide dissolved in the, in the water, et cetera? And in fact, uh, lots of folks have devoted their, their lives to doing this. And, um, and we, yeah, I can talk further if you guys are interested in that, but, but, but really cool stuff. Okay, awesome. So we've talked about the coolness of water. We've talked about how unique our planet is. One of the key things is that we are a water planet. We have the three phases of water in abundance at the same time on the surface of our planet, awesome. And this, these properties of water have direct influence on the, the goings on, the functioning of planet Earth, and therefore how our resources are distributed around the Earth. And therefore they have strong implications for um, management, for why we're in the situation we're in, how we might be able to respond to get ourselves out of a given management situation. Um, that's not the whole picture, but that's, that's the start. That's the basis of it. Any questions about that stuff?